We had some exciting things happening today, and uh, I have a tie on today, okay? You know something special is happening, right, when I wear a tie? <laughs> Do not expect this next Sunday. Do not expect this again until Christmas, and then it will come out at Easter, okay? Uh, unless we have a funeral, okay, then I wear my tie for that. I might even put my jacket on for a funeral, uh, but today... We are celebrating, and uh, so I know a lot of our people are going to be at the next service, right? And uh, at the end of the next service at 11 o'clock, uh, probably about 1230, uh, we're having a reception in honor of Ray and June Ricks. Now, this is awesome, right? They've been married 61 years, and they were married June 6th, okay? Now, when they got married, they didn't have a whole lot of money, and uh, so they never had a reception. You know, a lot of times you have a reception after the ceremony. Uh, they never, have, never had one. And so we're giving them a wedding reception uh, this afternoon, right? right? We're going to have a party, celebration, and uh, we're going to be in the new part. If you haven't seen that, uh, just don't tell anybody f- from the city we're doing this, okay? And Because uh, uh, we don't have occupancy yet for that part. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is going to be great, okay? Uh, we've got some pictures of them. Uh, A wedding cake is going to be delivered here in a little bit. And so this is what I want you to do, okay? Uh, After Sunday school, right, go home, grab your favorite dish, bring it back, okay? And I know there's going to be fried chicken here, right? There's going to be a lot of uh, good eating here uh, this afternoon. So I want to invite you all to come back as we celebrate with Ray and June Ricks. Now, now Ray's got cancer, and uh, he won't be with us too much longer. Uh, So at the end of the service, I'm going to have a prayer uh, of dedication for them. And uh, in this service, too, I've, I've got to also pray for uh, Cayman and his mom, Christy, are uh, heading to the Dominican Republic, and uh, that's going to be cool. They're leaving tonight, right? You're leaving this, the, tonight uh, on a mission trip, so uh, uh, don't let me forget that, okay? Don't let me forget to uh, do that at the end uh, of the service this morning just before we are dismissed. But if you're a guest, hey, thanks for being with us today, all right? I'm so glad that you are here. Some of you had birthdays this last week, all right? And uh, some of you had anniversaries last week. And uh, Josh Goodman is here, my buddy, all right? And uh, Josh Goodman and his family uh, are charter members of Hickory Ridge Community Church. And uh, so good to have uh, Joshua here with us this morning. Uh, I met a few of you other people who are visiting in in town. And uh, we have somebody here all the way from Washington State, right? Not Washington, D.C., Washington State, just to hear me preach this morning. And I'm so glad that she came uh, all those miles, right? This is awesome, right? Uh, so th- we got global influence, guys. Anybody from a foreign country here this morning? And uh, yeah, yeah, West Virginia, that's a foreign country. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, no, Australia, right? Yes. Uh, so cool, cool, man. God is good. And I uh, just came from the prison. I know that sounds odd, right? Uh, just came from the cr- prison. They let me out. And uh, Kirk gave a great message today, and uh, we're praying for Kirk. Uh, Kirk's dad passed away on Wednesday, 86 years young, and uh, Kirk's mom and dad were married the same day as Ray and June Ricks, the same year as Ray and June Ricks. And uh, so that that is cool. They would have had 61 years of marriage. So Kirk, great message this morning, and uh, we're praying for you uh, and your family during this time. And uh, I'm so glad that all of you are here today, okay? I'm going to pray in just a minute uh, for our services. And, uh, you know, this is what we pray. We pray, okay, Lord, uh, would you make us receptive to the message, okay? Uh, Some of you I know are tired. We had some people that were here to almost midnight last night uh, getting ready uh, for today. And uh, I wasn't here that long. uh, But some of our people were here late last night getting ready for the day. And uh, so this is a special day. Every day we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And, and you know what's cool? Uh, we will never, ever, ever be gathered together just like this, okay? Because next Sunday we're going to still be here at 830, but, but some of you won't be here, right? So, and there'll be different people here, and the, the environment will be different, and the circumstances will be different. So, so I want you to realize that this is a very special time uh, that we are having this morning, and uh, we're going to invite the presence of the Lord to be here. Now, the, the God's presence is here, right? God's everywhere, okay? But, but sometimes we're not really keenly aware of his presence, because we've got too many things going on in our mind, right? Uh, and some of you are worried about what you're going to have for lunch today. Uh, some of you are going to be worried about what's going to happen. Don't worry about anything else, okay? Just be focused on what God is going to do today, okay? So in a moment, I'm going to pray. But before I, we do that, I've got to show you some pictures, okay? And uh, we've got some new members. Uh, Fourteen new families have joined the church. And uh, because we do two services, it's hard to get them all in one service. And so I, I got a picture of them all, okay? Uh, so I want to show you these pictures of these uh, new members. I will introduce them to you so that when you see them, 
you know who they are, okay? So here, here's the first picture. Uh, there it is, okay, Chris and Amy Oxner. They go to the 11 o'clock service, right? They've got three kids, well, two kids, as you can see, the third one on the way. Uh, and so uh, this is a really a neat couple. Uh, uh, Chris is a Navy doctor, okay? So if you get any problems medically, Chris will take care of you, okay? And, uh, and, and Amy uh, is uh, homeschooling her kids, and uh, they, are, they, they moved here from New Orleans, okay? And uh, they, got, they got out of that, that, the cesspool of, of that area down there and came up here to the promised land and uh, will be with us uh, for about three years, and they're really hoping and praying that this will be their last day and they can retire and, and be here because uh, they love the area so much. So that's Chris and Amy. Uh, the next couple or next family uh, are in this service, right? There he is right there, Big Al, and, uh, and his wife, uh, Michelle, and his daughter, Sarah, and uh, Sarah just got her driver's license, and uh, hey, hey, Michelle, I want you to know, she drives a lot slower than you, okay? Now, now yesterday I was pulling out of my neighborhood, right? I saw this black path wave go flying by me, right? It was your wife, Al. I'm sorry, she was speeding, okay? Citizen's arrest, right? No, 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 we won't do that, okay? Uh, but, but I got behind Sarah on Wednesday night, coming to youth, right? And I'm like, who is this person? This, I said, this has got to be an old lady, or... <laughs> It's going to be a teenager, okay? And it was a teenager, and uh, I'm glad it honked the horn at her, flashed the lights, you know, because uh, she pu pulled in the turn lane right in front of me. And that would not have been good, right, if I had honked the horn at her and found out she was kind of, I would have just got, kept going right past the church uh, if that had happened, okay? I would not have stopped. I would have keep on rolling, okay? So uh, Alan, new follower of Christ, baptized Alan and his daughter, and uh, Michelle was praying for that family. She She's the one that kept them all together, and uh, so great to have uh, the Bollinger family. They have an older son who is uh, property of the United States Navy, and uh, he has just uh, enlisted, gone through basic, graduated, doing good, and uh, so that's cool. That's uh, the Bollinger family, okay? This is Alan Caps, and uh, Alan, I think, will be at the, he's not in the service, is he? Uh, Alan is uh, an old Moyakian and uh, moved up to Great Bridge and uh, loves the Lord. He's into sports, okay, so he's going to help us with some of the things we do with our sports uh, ministry through our youth ministry. Uh, so Alan Caps is a new member. And then this next uh, picture is of Pastor Tom Brown, the right river most holy. Where is he? He's here somewhere, right? There he is right there. Uh, he does prison ministry and uh, does celebrate recovery. He'll be there tomorrow. He was there this morning. And uh, Pastor Tom is going to be involved in outreach and a uh, really cool guy, okay? Uh, loves the Lord, loves uh, doing ministry of recovery, and so great to have Pastor Tom now as a member. I'm glad he finally joined because he's been coming here forever. Uh, finally uh, decided to go ahead and join us. So welcome, Pastor Tom. Uh, Dan and Peg Delion, uh, are they in the service? No, I don't think they are. I think they're out of town. If I, they're in my small group. I should know everything about it. Kate, do you know where they are? They're out of town. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm glad we got that update. And uh, Kate and Dan... Uh, also live in Moyoc. How many of y'all live in Moyoc? How many Moyocians have we got here? Okay, very good, 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 good. Uh, I'm glad you came. Put your shoes on before you came back into Virginia. And uh, good to have all of our Carolina people here this morning. Uh, Dan and Peg, love the Lord from Pennsylvania, and uh, moved here. And uh, Dan works for Noah, uh, where Sharon works. And uh, so great, uh, great couple to love the Lord. And so we welcome them to our church. The next family, next guy, Joe Pruitt is back there in the back row, back row Baptist, love it, and, uh, and Joe uh, is, uh, worked for me, okay, and uh, he taught me a lot while he was working for me, and uh, he was my cl clerk, and uh, does a lot of good work, and, uh, and this, is, this is Kate, Kate, right, uh, Kate, I haven't met you, Kate, but I have now, okay, so uh, welcome, Kate, and uh, she's from uh, North Carolina, somewhere down there, uh, you know, the other side of Edenton, down a little lower that area, and uh, so good to have her with us. So welcome, Joe, uh, to, our, to our team. And then Lisa Goodwin and Charles Curling are right over here, right? And uh, this young couple engaged to be married, and what, why do you want to do that? something crazy like that, all right? Yeah, yeah, somebody once said marriage is a great institution, but who wants to be in, in, in an institution, right? Uh, so, uh, but hey, congratulations. Good to have you all here with us. And, uh, and you, might have, you might see Lisa drive one of those big yellow school buses, you know, uh, with the city of Chesapeake. And so we're so glad that you guys 
have joined us, and uh, they live in Hickory, and uh, so great to have you guys as part of the family, okay? Next, now this knucklehead right here, uh, this, this guy, uh, Jimmy Harris, okay, now we started a new ministry, right? It's called Real Life, okay? And uh, I told our graduates um, on Friday night, real life begins when you graduate from high school, okay? That's the beginning of the real life, okay? So this guy, Jimmy Harris, uh, is... Uh, I know he looks like Gangster G, but, you know, he's not, he's not okay. And uh, I know it looks, uh, you know, he is dating my daughter, uh, so he is under heavy scrutiny, okay? Uh, I've done a background check on him, and uh, the police reports are all come back. Uh, working on the financial statements right now to see where he is. And uh, so, uh, so that's Jimmy Harris, and uh, he is teaching our real-life ministry, okay, that started last Sunday. And uh, at 10 o'clock, we have a class for... All of our young adults who are out of high school, or we've got several that are graduating, uh, please join that class. They do activities together, and, uh, and, and, and I want you to join it so you can keep an eye on this guy right here, okay? And make sure he doesn't mess around, you know, with my daughter too much, and make, you know, make sure he doesn't behave himself, okay? Uh, so uh, you guys can be spies for that class, all right? So that's, that's Jimmy Harris. He's uh, joined the church. And then uh, Stephen and Ashley Inks. Uh, I believe they're out of town. They had a family member uh, that uh, has, has uh, graduated, and so uh, they're out of town. And a uh, great couple. They've got two children. Uh, Ashley is uh, working with us a little bit at the academy, and, uh, and Steve uh, works at, uh, up at a, uh, a calibrations company in Norfolk. And uh, new believers, okay, and uh, just beginning their walk with Christ, kind of a cool thing. And uh, so God's doing great things. Ashley was just baptized a few weeks ago. And, uh, man, it's exciting to see young couples uh, getting right with God and, and joining the team here, okay? All right, let's see who's next. Um, are we getting to the end of this list here pretty soon? Daniel Soto, all right. Uh, Marine, yeah, he, he's a tough dude. And uh, his wife, Ednita, took the class uh, like, like last fall. And, uh, and, and he watched the kids so she could come to class, and not that it did a flip-flop. And uh, so they, are, uh, they live right close by, and so the Soto family are now members of the Hickory Ridge community family. That's really kind of cool. Great to have them uh, with us. Okay, next uh, slide. Uh, Peter and Jennifer Larvik, okay? Are they in this service? No, they come to the second service. They don't like to get up early, but uh, they... Another Marine, okay? Semper Fi, right? Uh, my... Man, I love these Marines, and, uh, and Jennifer is, is much, she, she's much sweeter than Peter, okay? And uh, they're involved with my, uh, my Sunday school class. We started a class uh, uh, about eight months ago. The pastors fell, well, it was started as, as one class and evolved into another class, and uh, so they're involved in our class, and uh, they're going to be involved with our youth and doing a few other things with us here, okay? All right, Tony in Virginia, Knowles, Okay. Uh, Tony has been around forever, man. He's done uh, a lot of construction, worked with Pastor Bruce for years, and uh, Virginia works with Annette at Farm Fresh, and uh, they're in the Wednesday night small group. These guys love the Lord, awesome couple, and uh, they were involved with, the, uh, with what's going on this afternoon, this reception. Uh, the brainchild of this reception, I, I got blamed for it. It wasn't my fault that, this, that we're doing this, okay? Uh, this was their small group idea, and the group that uh, Virginia and Tony are part of, uh, they said, hey, why don't we honor, you know, Ray and June Ricks? I said, sure, let's do it. And uh, so uh, they are new to our church. They come to the second service also, okay? Uh, is that everybody? No, oh, we got one more. Okay, Joyce will be at the second service also. And uh, Joyce Ev Edwards uh, will be getting baptized real soon, okay? And, uh, man, she is really a neat lady, okay? Uh, she is the mother of Sheila Wimbish. And uh, Sheila has the, uh, the privilege of being the closest member to our church. She can walk to our church. That's how close she is. And uh, this is her mom, lives on Benefit Road, and uh, neighbors with Margaret uh, and Dave Perry. And uh, she's a great lady. Love uh, Miss Joyce. And so we welcome her to the family as well. Okay, I think that's everybody. Okay, this is our graduation. All right. We had a graduation, and uh, there's a big kid right in the middle. She was really getting into it, okay? Miss Christie... Man, she was singing so loud, right, and so exuberantly, right? What a blessing. You got all those kids uh, uh, excited. Uh, this is at their award ceremony, and so congratulations. We had a K-5 graduation Thursday night, 
an award ceremony Friday, a high school graduation Friday night, and uh, this next slide is going to show the two graduates that we had. Uh, we had three graduates. One graduated in uh, January, uh, January, and then Megan and Miranda graduated Friday night. So congratulations to them. These are our first uh, graduates from the academy, and uh, we praise God for them. So that's it, I think, on the slides, okay? Welcoming these new people and, uh, and praising God for what he's doing. And God's really doing some neat things, okay? So today we're beginning a brand new series. If this is your first time with us, man, you picked a great Sunday to come, okay? Every Sunday is a great Sunday to start coming to the church, and I'm glad that you are here. So I want to I be prepared. I want you to be prepared uh, for what God has to say to you today. So let's stand to our feet, okay? And, uh, and let's do this. Let's do our prayer of dedication right now. Christy, come on up here. Came and come on up here. Let's do this now, okay? Because uh, me and my ADHD will forget, okay? Uh, so this is what I want. I want to pray uh, for Christy and Cayman as they head off as our missionaries uh, this evening. And uh, so we are going to lift them up. And so this is what I want to do real quick, okay? Can, can we all come up around them, right? Uh, don't suffocate them, right? Just come on up here around them. And if you can't get a hand on them, right, uh, get a hand on somebody who has a hand on them. And, uh, and Rick is Mr. Missions, right? Rick is our missions dude, all right? So uh, I'm going to ask him to pray for traveling mercies, pray for a productive ministry, pray to get a lot done in a short amount of time. And uh, we have this prayer of dedication for you, Christy, and Cayman, and the rest of the team that will be going. So, Brother Rick, would you do that for us? A hand, all right, and head on back to your seat. All right, as you head back to your seat, uh, I hope you received a, a bulletin this morning, and I hope that you have your Bible with you this morning. And if you don't, we'll have most of the verses uh, on the overhead today. But man, I'm so glad that you're here. This is an exciting day. And the good Lord has been so good to us. And uh, you know, this, is, uh, this has been the fifth weekend that we have had with no rain. Did you know that? Fifth weekend where temperatures have been above 70, right? And uh, man, this is a great place to live. And uh, praise God for that. Now, I know we were all depressed in the, the wintertime. It was cold and all that. But uh, man, summer is here. And uh, we got a lot of things happening next Sunday. We've got a group of kids going off uh, to youth camp, so we'll be praying for them uh, next Sunday. And, uh, man, exciting things are happening. I'm so pumped up about what God is doing, right? God is moving in a supernatural way, okay? And, and so when we see how God moves, uh, we want to jump on board with what he is doing, not come up with our own plan, okay? And I think that's the biggest struggle that I've had as a Christian, right? Where I sit down and say, well, let me come up with a great plan and then ask God to bless it. And so I said, well, forget your plans, forget my plans. Uh, find out where God is moving, right? And, and then jump on board with what he's doing, okay? You ought to do that when you're looking for a church. Uh, you know, don't, if your church is dead, don't go to dead church, all right? Uh, Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, okay? Uh, if you attach yourself to something dead, you become dead. Attach yourself to something living, right? And, and then you bring life to that, and the Spirit of God can move in that, and great things can happen, okay? So, so we're beginning the book of Galatians. I want to give you some background uh, of this book before we read the first 10 verses, okay? Paul started these series of churches. It wasn't just one church in Galatia. Uh, he started these series of these churches, and, and man, awesome things are happening. People are getting saved, baptized, added to the church, and the gospel is spreading like wildfire. The church is being persecuted, but that's pushing them out uh, into the community. That's pushing them around the then known world, and, uh, and, and Paul takes these three major missionary journeys, and at the conclusion of these three missionary journeys, something phenomenal happens, something that hasn't happened since. All of the then known world was evangelized. Not that everybody got saved, but all of the then known world was exposed to the gospel. I, I, Paul was very strategic in how he did this. He went to the, the cities, he went to the capitals, and uh, he went into uh, the temples, and he went where people met, and he proclaimed Christ crucified, risen, and coming again. And, and lo and behold, people began to get saved. And the church begins to grow uh, phenomenally and exponentially, it just like, it's taken off, okay? 
So, so now Paul is checking in with the churches that he had started, and, and he would send them letters, okay? The reason it's so important to be in a church, because God speaks through his church, okay? And, and when you look at how God has written his word, uh, when you look at, for example, the book of Galatians, that was written to the churches of Galatia. When you look at the book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, that was written to the church at Corinth, who was a messed up church. So, so they didn't get it the first time, so Paul sends them another letter uh, to try to get them straight. And, and so when you look at when Paul is writing letters, the reason it's so important to be in God's umbrella of protection of a church is that God speaks through his church. And when you get outside there, you miss, okay? You get secondhand information. Uh, when you're involved in the church, you are moving where God is moving. You're involved with his work of evangelism. And Jesus said, you know, there's only really two things that you need to do. If you really want to be successful, n- number one, you've got to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and then he said the second is like unto the first. The, the second is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, and how do you love your neighbor? You, you love your neighbor by giving them the gospel, by sharing Christ in, uh, in you with them, and they get saved. I mean, how better way to show somebody you really love them uh, than by sharing the gospel with them? So that's what Paul did. He starts his church, Okay. Unlike some of his other epistles, Paul had a way of always starting epistles that would grab your attention, right? And, he, and he'd say, to the church at Corinth, or the church at Rome. And, he, and he'd say something like this, I thank God every time I remember of you, every time I remember you, okay? And he would do that, because I mean, these people were near and dear to his heart. However, when we come to the book of Galatians, Paul doesn't start it that way. He starts it in a different way. You know, he, he's, he's, he's giving him grace and peace, okay? But, but where's the thanksgiving? You know, he's withholding the thanksgiving because there's something that is not right in this church. It's, so let's pick it up at verse number one, Galatians chapter one. And, and it's Paul, and he calls himself an apostle, sent not from man, but by God, by Jesus Christ and God the Father. So, so, so Paul is saying, I am an apostle. Now, there's only 13 apostles. There's 12. Paul was the 13th. Judas forfeited his position. So, so really there's only 12, right? These, by definition, we could say maybe capital A apostle, was one who had seen Christ while he was alive, his resurrected body, had personal experience with him, and they weren't called by a group within a church. They were called by direct revelation by Christ. And that's where Paul's revelation came from. Okay, so, so he's, he's setting up his credentials, and he's saying, you know, I wasn't called by anybody, all right? I was called by Christ and God the Father, you know, the guy who raised him up from the dead. We're talking about God the Father raising Jesus up from the dead. And he says, and all the brothers and the sisters with me to the churches. Okay, there it is. It's not singular. It's plural to the churches in Galatia. Verse 3, he says, grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, And here he's saying the same thing again, right? Who gave himself up for our sins to rescue us from this present evil according to the will of God our Father, to him, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So so here we have three verses where Paul two times talks about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Talks about his position as an apostle. We get down to verse number six. He says these words. "I, I am astonished. Now, now, let me tell you something. Whenever Paul or whenever Jesus says they are astonished, they are not astonished by our greatness of our faith. They are astonished by something else. They're not astonished that we're doing so much for the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm shocked you guys are doing so much. I can't believe what you're doing, right? Because we serve a God who is unlimited in power, unlimited in knowledge, unlimited in resources uh, he knows everything he empowers everything okay so so it's not astounding that we can do great things through christ really that's not because it is he that is doing it it's not us that is doing it paul is not astounded that their faith is so great he's astounded at just the opposite he's astonished that they are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of christ and are turning to a different gospel. He says, which is really no gospel at all. It's a different belief system that that you're putting on the same level as the gospel, 
but, but it's really not a gospel of all at all. He says, evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. This is Stan's fault, right? He, he's astonished that this has happened to them and that it happened so quickly to them. I mean, they saw life transformed. They were dead in their trespasses and sin, dead under the, the weight of the law. Grace comes along. The gospel comes around. The good news of Jesus Christ. Their lives are transformed. But it doesn't seem like it's very long lived. They're going back to pervert the gospel of Christ. So, so Paul drives home this point. He says, now listen, even if we, that's the other apostles, or an angel from heaven should preach the gospel other than the one that we preach to you. Let them be under God's curse. Anathema, or, or anathema. Let them be God damned, is what he's saying. You're falling under God's curse by abandoning the gospel. We've already said so, and now I say it again. If anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Verse number 10 we're going to look at next week, but, but I wanted to just, just briefly look at verse number 10. And, and Paul says, you know, am I trying to win approval of human beings or of God? Am I trying to please people? You know, if I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, so this morning as we look at this brief passage here, we're, we're learning that Paul is defining the gospel defending the gospel, proclaiming the gospel, and the recipients of that gospel, he is astounded that they have left the gospel. Now, now this is not a, a, a new problem, right? This is a problem, I believe, that we still struggle with today. So, so Paul puts in this caveat, now listen, I wasn't called by any man, okay, so I'm, I'm not trying to please any man. He, he says, I wasn't called by anybody else, I've called by Jesus Christ himself, I'm not trying to win the approval of men. If, if, I, if I were, I would go along to get along. I, I would try to spin this thing. I would try to twist this thing. I would try to re-explain the gospel so that you would accept me. And he'd say, no, I can't do that. Because the gospel is much too profound for me to tinker with it, to tamper with it. It's not my message. It's not a message that just turns your life around a little bit. It's not a message of reformation. It's a, re a message of transformation. You, you were dead in your trespasses and your sin, and you became alive when you heard the good news of Jesus Christ. It radically changed you. H how could you leave this? How could you turn your back on this? How could you be so complacent about this is what he's saying. Charles Swindoll has a book called Growing Stronger in the Seasons of Life. And in his book, he shares about the 19th century agnostic, Thomas Huxley. Huxley was the guy who promoted Darwinism and humanism and uh, had many attacks on Christianity. Huxley was in Dublin and was rushing to catch a train. He jumped aboard one of Dublin's most famous horse-drawn taxis and said to the driver, hurry, I'm almost late, drive fast. Off went the driver at a furious pace. Huxley sat back in his seat and he closed his eyes. After a while, Huxley opened up his eyes and he glanced out the window to notice that they were going in the wrong direction. Realizing that he hadn't told the driver where to take him, he called out, do you know where you're going? The driver replied, no, your honor, but I'm driving very fast. As we look at the church, the churches of Galatia, they were running fast, but they didn't know where they were going. They had, they had lost their way. And, and Paul says, I, I'm astonished that you have abandoned, deserted the gospel. I, I mean, when we had nothing, we came to Christ. And, and he turned our lives around, and for a couple years we did great. And, and he patches up our lives, and he puts things together. And then all of a sudden we don't think we need him anymore. We abandon the gospel. And he's astonished at this. He cannot believe this, that this is happening. You see, sometimes as we look at our lives, I think we can quickly run on an emotion and then it fizzles out real fast. 
If we do not understand the depth of the gospel, the good news of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and if we do not put our faith and trust in that exclusively, we can quickly abandon the truth that God has given us. Paul says you are, you're, you're abandoning the, your post. And he says, I can't believe that this is happening so quickly. Uh, the Greek word that can also be translated so easily, right? You, you, you're easily getting off track. Petty little things are getting you off track. You know, I've discovered that most Christians who get off track don't get off track because of the big things. They get off track because of the little things. Little unresolved conflicts, little issues that really don't matter to a hill of beans, but they get off track on the little things. And Paul says, I can't believe that this is happening to you so quickly or so easily. He says, you're deserting the gospel. That, that's a military term. When a member of the military abandons his post, leaves his duty, falls away. And, and Paul's saying, you are abandoning one who has given you life, and one who has said he will never leave you, nor forsake you, you you're abandoning this? Are you crazy? Have you lost your mind? How could you do this? You see, Paul had such a radical transformation that he could not imagine going back to the old life. He tried that people-pleasing thing. He, he tried all of the rituals. And he tried going through, and, and he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, all right? He was Ph.D. level Pharisees. He was the one who taught the teachers of the Pharisees. He would teach the rabbis. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, the most famous rabbi of all, other than Jesus Christ. And, and Paul's looking, and he says, I, I just, I can't believe that God has done so much for you, and you so easily give up on him. You're going to drop out? What, I, you have lost your mind. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln said this. We as a nation have been recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have forgotten the gracious hand which has preserved us, which has given us peace and multiplied our riches and strengthened us. And we vainly imagined in the deceitfulness of our hearts that all of these blessings were produced by some superior wisdom or virtue that was within our own selves. We have become intoxicated and unbroken with our success. We have become too self-sufficient to feel this necessity of redeeming and preserving God's grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us and the God that redeemed us. That's exactly what we are in danger of. That we so quickly abandon the gospel and how Christ has turned us around. You know, I've been doing this long enough that I can tell you there's a, there's a danger point for every Christian. That the danger point for every Christian is when they reach the level of maturity of becoming an adolescent. For some Christians, that happens within two or three years of, of accepting Christ, some between three and five years. It varies based upon the level of growth that that individual will experience. Some are slower learners, so they may be saved for 10 years or 15 years or maybe even 20 years, but as they grow, conflict is going to come. They're going to hit this point in their life where they're going to take for granted all that Christ has done for them. It's a very subtle thing, but it will happen. As a matter of fact, it is part of the maturing process. If I can parallel it to, to our children, right? When your children are young, they love you unconditionally. They think that you are like God, right? You are awesome. They always want to hang with you. They always want to do stuff with you. They think there's nobody like dad. There's nobody like mom. Whatever you tell them, it doesn't matter if it's the truth or not. They just believe it, right? And they love you unconditionally. They think that you are awesome. I love mom. I love dad. They are great. I'm so glad I'm part of the family. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. And then, you know what happens? They turn into teenagers. Yeah, yeah, they turn into these rebel hearts. And all of a sudden, you, as their parent, are a complete idiot. You know nothing. You're out of touch with reality. You don't understand how this generation thinks or how this generation works. 
Uh, you're kind of old school. Yeah, you can't even program your cell phone without them. And, and so you're out of touch, right? You don't got it together anymore. And they go through this time of rebellion. Now, this is a dangerous place because, because this is what has happened in our culture. We've stretched out this adolescent stage. So, so now it's going from age 13 all the way up to about 26. Yeah, yeah, we stretched it out, right? Yeah, that's why your kids are like in their 20s and still living with you. And you're like, I wish you would go away. Yeah, yeah, there's this maturing process, right? If they come out on the other side, great. But some never seem to grow up. Many Christians fall in the same category. They come to that adolescent age where they know enough to be dangerous, right? They, they can spit back some scriptures to you, but, but all of a sudden, they resent you. You know, you, they, they say, oh, you don't know anything, man. Who are you? You know, you're old school. Man, you don't know anything. You don't know. Do you realize we're living in 2014? Yeah, you're, you're out of time. Do you realize that there's a whole different environment, a whole different culture? What used to be wrong is no longer wrong. What used to be right is no longer right. Things have changed, Okay. And they go through this time of rebellion. As Christians, Paul is addressing the Galatians because this is where they are. Right? They're going through this time of rebellion. And as we look at this text, they're rebelling against Christ and the gospel, but they're rebelling against the mouthpiece, the messenger who is giving them the gospel. They're rebelling against Paul. One of the indications that you know your children are in trouble is they start rebelling against you as their authority. And they start rebelling against other th authorities. And, and so really there's a bigger issue that they're rebelling against God's authority. But because they can't really address God directly, they, they take it out on us as his, as his mouthpiece. If we can grow past this stage, that is when you become dangerous. You know, every morning when you wake up, as a mature follower of Christ, Satan ought to say this. To you and to God. If you're a mature follower of Christ, he ought to say this to you and to me. Oh crap, he's awake. Yeah. But you know what? Satan doesn't have to say that about most of us when we wake up because our level of maturity is so low and the level of rebellion is so high that we, he doesn't have to mess with us. He doesn't even have to mess with us because we are our own, our own problem. You see, when you look at the gospel, I hadn't planned on using this verse, but let's turn to 1 Corinthians 15. There, there are four facets of the gospel found in 1 Corinthians 15. And as you look at this, Paul is, is making it clear to the brothers and sisters of Christ. And if you drop down to verse number three, he's talking about wanting to have them have a clear understanding of the gospel that he preached to them and that they received, and when they received it, they must stand. As a matter of fact, one of the indications that you know you have received the gospel is not only have you received it, but you're standing in the gospel. And if you can be even easily driven off that, you may not have ever received the gospel. And so Paul, verse number three says, I passed on to you as the first importance, which I also received. And here's the first part of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Okay? Part number one, the gospel is Christ dying on that cross for our sins. Part number two, okay, uh, that he was buried, all right, came off the cross, put him in a barred man's tomb. Uh, that's part number two. Num number three is that he raised again the third day according to the scriptures, okay? That's the third part of the gospel, the death, the burial, the resurrection, him dying for our sins. And, and here's the fourth part. Here's the confirmation that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Okay, Paul was there. Paul was one that he appeared to in Acts chapter 9. The risen Savior appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus. That's why he was who he was. That's why he could claim to be an apostle. You know, in the truest sense of the word, there is no such thing as an apostle today. Because none of us have seen the risen Savior except those original 12. Now, I know we use the word apostle and we use it in a different manner. But, but when you look at the true context of what an apostle is. It is one who has seen the risen Savior, the, the physical resurrected body of Christ. And it changes them radically. Changes them. 
That is what the gospel is. When we look at the definition of the gospel, what it is, it's delivered to us when we were lost and hopeless. Not only were we lost, okay? We were hopelessly lost. In other words, we, were, we, we had no relationship with God and we had no way of having a relationship with him. And have, there was no hope that we'd ever have a relationship with him because what was required to have a relationship with him is something that we could not produce. We could not produce holiness. We couldn't. No matter how hard we tried. Hebrews chapter 2 says, So what makes us think that we can escape if we ignore this great salvation that was first announced by the Lord Jesus Christ himself and then was delivered to us by those who heard him speak. We had no hope. Hope comes along in Christ. And, and we think we're going to escape if we abandon this hope or if we do not receive this hope. Paul, Paul says, no, 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 you're not going to escape if you ignore or abandon this great salvation, this gospel message. It must be received. Here's the second point of what the gospel is. It is Jesus dying in place of us. He took our place. Even if I died on that cross, I couldn't have atoned for my sins because I have a dead man paying for a dead man's sin. I have a sinner paying for a sinner. And it doesn't eradicate any sin because I am on that same level. When Christ died in our place, he was delivered over to death. And our sins were placed upon him. And then he rose again. He defeated our sin at the resurrection. He paid for them, paid in full, proven by the resurrection of Christ, given through the apostles. What a powerful message this is of how a world can be turned upside down because of the power of the gospel and what Christ has done in our place. God accepted the work of Christ on behalf of raising him from the dead. Peter puts it this way, for Christ also suffered once for the sins. Okay, once, when he died one time. Every sin that you have committed or will commit or have committed in the past, every sin that anybody who's ever been alive or ever will be alive was placed on, on that cross. Peter says it was the righteous dying for the unrighteous. Why? So they can bring us to God by being put to death in the flesh and being made alive in the spirit. And Paul is looking at these churches at Galatia and he says, I cannot believe you have abandoned this. How could you do such a thing? Ephesians 1.9 talks about God's incomparable great power that he gives us who believe in him. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. What, what Paul's saying, listen, guys, how can you abandon this? How can you leave this? How can you turn your back on this? Do you realize that when you became a follower of Christ and you received the gospel of Jesus Christ, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is the same power that takes up presence within you? Yeah, yeah, the Spirit of God moves into us. His power is indwelling us, and we are never again the same. We are transformed. No more low living, no more old life, no more negative thinking. That is dead, that is gone. We were dead in our trespasses and our sins, but thanks be to God, we have been resurrected, we've been brought into life because of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, why is it so dangerous, and, and why is this gospel so great? There are three dangers I want to give to you real quick as we kind of try to wrap things up. Danger number one of why the gospel is so great and why we should not abandon it is because it's all of God's will in all of God's grace. When we came to Christ, it was all of God's doing. Peter put it this way, God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. The will of God is that every one of us have a relationship with Christ. And the only way that can happen is not because of what we have done. It is because all of his grace. It was his will that we accept the free gift of salvation. It is his grace that allows us to receive that gift. When we reject that gift, we are not rejecting our will. We're rejecting God's will. This is a matter of rebellion. You see, we say, well, I made my own decision. I do my own thing, and, and, and I'm in power, and I'm in control. 
When we say we reject God, you are rejecting God's will for your life. And he is such a gentleman, he says, I will let you reject my will. That's your prerogative. But my grace is sufficient. It is my will that you would come to repentance. The third danger is the danger, I'm sorry, the second danger is the danger of confusion. That is rebelling against God. John 1, 12 and 13 says, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, right? You thought you had a will in this matter? Now your will is surrendered to God's will when you adopt a rebellious spirit. I'll put it this way, in the Old Testament with King Saul, he says the spirit of rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. When we reject the will of God for our salvation, we're not really following our will. We can't. We're following the will of of the arch enemy of our souls, Satan himself. We are giving over to his will when we reject the gospel. You see, we are so immature in our thinking, we're thinking, well, I had something to do with this. I ain't rejecting you. I ain't rejecting Jesus. I ain't just, I'm just not accepting him. No. Your heart is a rebellious heart that is accepting the will of Satan in the guise of, I got my own will, and I'm rejecting Christ. You see how slick the enemy works? Confusion was coming into the church because of this misunderstanding of the gospel. Romans 16, 25 says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that had been kept secret for long ages. So there's this danger of confusion. There's also this danger of perversion. I put in quotes liberalism. Liberalism is subtracting from the gospel. I'm not talking about political liberalism. I'm talking about theological liberalism is we're we're subtracting from the gospel. We're reversing the gospel is what we're doing. We're believing that the gospel is not enough and it will not exclusively bring salvation. And we're saying, well, our roads lead to heaven because God is such a gracious God. Our, Our roads must eventually get to heaven because that's how God is, right? He's a gracious, loving, merciful God. He doesn't send anybody to hell. You're right, he doesn't send anybody to hell. When you surrender your will to Satan with a rebellious heart, you send yourself to hell. That's what happens. The gospel becomes perverted when we say, all roads lead to heaven. I mean, if all roads lead to heaven, then Jesus' death on the cross was a total waste. I mean, if there was some other way, why did he have to die? Why did he have to go through all that suffering? Why did he raise again? If it doesn't really matter what Jesus has done. You see, it does matter. Because without the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, our gospel is vain. There's no hope for us. But here we are, 2,000 years after the fact. The gates of hell have tried to prevail against the church, but the church is still growing and still thriving, and God's doing powerful things throughout the world because the enemy cannot thwart the gospel. The gospel trumps the enemy. The love of Christ is better than the strongest rebel's heart. But the love of Christ will not override your will here's the next thing number four if we reject the gospel and easily abandon the gospel there's this danger of diversion which is legalism and this is what the church of galatia was struggling with they were adding to the gospel they were adding the letter of the law to the gospel Apostle, you guys are missing this the law can't save you the law says you are a lawbreaker That's what the law does. How do I know that I'm breaking a law? Because there's a law that I have trespassed against. The law cannot redeem me. The law says I must pay when the law is broken. Jesus says I've come to fulfill that law. I'm not going to eradicate that law. I'm fulfilling it. I'm saying that law has condemned you. I am your judge now, and I'm taking your penalty. I'm dying for you so that you can be set free from the penalties of the law. And here we see the early church is going back to legalism. Hebrews chapter 13, verse number 17. We say, well, why is all this so important? You ever talk to somebody and say, hey, let me ask you a question. If you were to die right now, 
where would you spend eternity? And sometimes I ask you, you know, hey, if St. Peter up there in heaven, and, and he, he's interviewing you, and he's going to say, hey, why should I let you to God's heaven? What are you going to say, right? So many people, well, you know, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I think it's a little scale up there in heaven, and good, bad. I know I'm not perfect, but I'm thinking my good is better than my bad. And, and, and furthermore, I think God must grade on the curve because, you know, I never murdered anybody, so, I, so murderers must be going to heaven. I never murdered anybody, so I'm going to heaven. And, and, you know, I'm not perfect, right? Nobody says, I'm, nobody says I'm perfect. I don't even know how you say that because we all know we're far from perfect, but, but we think we're, we're less imperfect than others. And so because we're less imperfect than some bad people that we know, that, that God must say, okay, you're a good little boy. Come on up here. And, and you did all those good things, right? But that's not how it works. We who are sinners, Hebrews 13, were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we have received salvation by his life. The forgiveness of sin. It saves me from sin. It changes my entire life. Now and forevermore. I didn't become a Christian by keeping the law. Try to ask somebody who keeps the law. Okay, you're keeping the Ten Commandments. You're trying to keep those Ten Commandments. Do you have the assurance that you're going to heaven? Do you know for sure, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that you're going to heaven? Well, I'm not sure, but I think I am. The law does not give the assurance that the grace of Christ can. The Spirit himself bears witness to my spirit that I am a child of God. I'm going to heaven not because I kept the law, because I broke the law. Every one of us has broken the law. The law revealed that I needed a Savior. I needed somebody who was bigger than me, stronger than me, better than me, holier than me. I couldn't make myself holy enough. I couldn't be in the presence of God because I am so unholy. That's how bad I am. As a matter of fact, when Moses was there at the burning bush, God said, Moses, take the sandals off your feet. We could put this in modern vernacular. God is saying to Moses, listen, I don't want your dirty shoes messing up my clean carpet. Take those shoes off. You're not going to come into my presence as an unholy person. You cannot be in my presence as an unholy person. God makes us holy by his grace. He reveals to us our need for holiness by giving us this law that he knows, he knows we can't fulfill it. We can't keep it. He knows that. God's not up in hands. Man, I can't believe you guys can't keep these laws. I only gave you ten commandments. You can't keep those? What's up with that? Yeah, we can't. God provides a way. It changes me now and forevermore. 1 Thessalonians 1 5 says, The gospel did not come to you merely in words, but in power and by the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. That's how the Spirit of God moves as the Word of God is proclaimed. And when we receive this gift, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. 2 Corinthians 3 5 and 6. Is not that we are not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything else as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency comes from God, who made us sufficient as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter of the law, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life everlasting. I put the words of a song that is taken from Romans. It says, "No power of hell, no scene of men, could ever pluck me from God's hand." So Paul is looking at the Galatian church and says, I can't believe that you're, you're living one way when you're around the Jewish believers and living another way around the Gentile believers. And you know, you're trying to be walking the fence and you're trying to be able to, 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 to be liked by all people and uh, don't want to offend anybody. And, and in the process, you end up offending God Almighty because you, you have abandoned the, the gospel. Now, now, we know this happens in real life. Right? It, it seems to me that oftentimes the people that we help the most, we give the most to, are always the ones who abandon us the most. Have you ever noticed that? It, you almost feel like, I ain't helping anybody, because when I help somebody, it seems like that's when they're going to abandon me. That's when they're going to betray me, right? Welcome to the world of Jesus, right? Yeah, if we understand that on a human level, right, how much, and we're, we're in, how much more do you think God his heart breaks. He says, you know what? I gave my only begotten son for you, and you took it, 
And I healed your life. I healed your marriage. I blessed your finances. I gave you good health. I gave you, I, I let you live in the richest nation in the world. And you're going to turn your back on me? Yeah, that's got to be like a dagger into the side of the Son of God. But Paul's looking at the Galatian church and he says, when we, when we get hung up on legalism, when we get back living under the, the tutor of the law, we're, we're, we're saying, God, you, you, Jesus' blood's not sufficient. I got to do this. And, and he says, when we can live any way we want and say the gospel hasn't changed us, we're doing the same thing. Neither liberalism or, or, or legalism will set a man free. We are, we are set free in Christ. Whom the Lord has set free is free indeed. And one of the strongest arguments that we have in closing is the changed life that we experience now and forevermore. Charles Bradlaugh was an avowed atheist and was an infidel. And he once challenged Pastor Hughes, the Reverend H.P. Hughes, to a debate. The preacher was a head of a rescue mission in London, England, and his challenge was accepted. But the challenge was accepted when Pastor Hughes says, I will debate you under one condition, and only one condition. When we gather together at a set time for this debate, I will bring 100 people from my rescue mission whose lives have been transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will have them share their testimony, then the de debate will begin. An agreement was made. On the night of the debate, Charles Bradloff was nowhere to be found. Well, we've got a group here together anyway. We've got skeptics and we've got believers together. Let's go ahead and do this anyway. And so the 100 men and women from the rescue mission stood up and testified of what Christ had done in their lives. They were going to submit themselves to cross-examination, but instead... <laughs> Spiritual awakening wakes up, and the skeptics that were gathered come forward and said, I want what you have. Nothing can transform a man like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, nothing can transform a world that is lost and dying like the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let not your heart be troubled. Let not your heart be lacking in faith. You are empowered by the Spirit of God if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you have surrendered to Him. Yes, there's going to be times of, of testing. There's going to be times of discouragement. There's going to be times when you want to rebel against the church, against those who are in spiritual authority. You're going to want to rebel against nature itself. You're going to want to rebel against the whole nine yards. But when the Spirit of God is taking up residence with you, just like the prodigal son when he was in that pig pen, he came to his senses. And Paul is writing this letter to the churches of Galatia, and he's saying, my prayer is that you come to your senses, that you once again realize the depth of how great the Savior's love is for you and the depth of the gospel of Jesus Christ that can redeem you and has redeemed you. Don't abandon the gospel. It's a cold, lonely world outside of God's protection. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to your family. Hang in there. God's Spirit will be with you. He promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. Even when we try to abandon him, he goes with us, but we are no longer having a solid connection with him. And we go into confusion because it's not a strong signal because we have stepped outside of his umbrella of protection. So it is my prayer today that if you don't know who Jesus Christ is, if you've never accepted him as Lord and Savior, that before we leave today, that you make him Lord of your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to pray. Then I'm going to ask Pastor Eric to come. We're going to receive the offering. And then we're going to be dismissed. But Lord, we come before you today as very weak vessels. The problem is, is we think we're strong. And that's why Paul says, when I am weak, then I'm made strong. So Lord, we want to become weak in the flesh so we may be strong in the spirit. And Lord, we've got to admit, the flesh is willing, and we're wanting to do what we want, but our human spirit is weak. So Lord, would you infuse us with the Spirit of God? Would you allow us to be strong in the faith? Lord, bad days are going to happen. We may face persecution. 
We may face uh, tremendous pressure to conform to this world, but Lord, we are your servants. We are children of the King. We're living in royalty because you have set us free. And so, Lord, we thank you for this great salvation. And, Lord, my prayer is that those who don't know Christ, maybe this morning there's somebody here who's not sure they have a relationship with Christ. Lord, would you give them the courage to talk to one of us before they leave. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise for all that. In Jesus' name, amen.